I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. All praise to Yahweh Elohim. What up, y'all? It's your boy Pac Ray, K. Perez, y'all from the Rumble Room. Today's discussion is titled Critics of the Trinity, the Deity of Christ, the Virgin Birth, and the Double Standard that they espouse against critics of Paul. The goal of this discussion is to analyze some conflicting beliefs and perspectives held by many in the Israelite community. And my hope is that we can bring some awareness to these problematic conflicting beliefs so that we can make motions to correct them. Why? Because conflicting beliefs signal an error in our belief system. An error obviously doesn't keep us on the path of truth. But error only begets more error. And the sooner we can steer the ship back in course, the better for the entire community. The conflicting belief we'll address in this discussion is the belief that the scriptures are fallible when speaking of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the virgin birth, and the infallibility of scriptures when certain objections to Paul, Paul's writings are raised. There's a clear double standard when one presumes that the scriptures are airsome when they speak of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the virgin birth, but not airsome concerning Paul's writings. The standard ought to be either that the scriptures are always infallible and ought to be trusted, ought to be trusted to take to take scripture at face value or that the scriptures are not infallible that is they are fallible and ought not always to be trusted to take scripture at face value furthermore that a person has full license to challenge scripture While many believe the biblical canon to be inherently infallible and without error, my personal position regarding biblical textual criticism is that the scriptures ought not always to be trusted to take scripture at face value and that a person does have full license to challenge scripture. I challenge the writings of the biblical canon and encourage all others to do so and here's why. History demonstrates clearly that Rome captured Israel. Rome, an enemy of Israel, also committed genocide and enslaved Israel. Amongst many other atrocities, Rome took control of Israel's sacred writings, the scrolls that would be included in today's modern Bible. History also demonstrates plainly that they altered our documents. Original books were taken apart and made into separate books. For instance, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. And Ruth was originally part of Judges. And Lamentations was part of Jeremiah. These separated books would be translated from fragmented parchments, translated from languages that include those not Hebrew. An example of altering Israelite documents is Roman Marcion, altering New Testament books, including Paul's epistles. As far as we're concerned, we don't know what an unaltered Pauline epistle looks like because Marcion altered them. And it was well understood that he had an agenda to minimize the importance of the law of Elohim. Eventually, Marcion would be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, but the church would keep his scriptural alterations. Yes, you heard it right. The Roman Catholic Church altered and put together the first forms of that book you call the Holy Bible. And that means you would likely not have your beloved KJV 1611 without the initial work of the Roman Catholic Church by its ecumenical councils. 
The uncomfortable reality is that the biblical canon was composed of original Israelite scriptures that fell into Roman hands. Hence your unbiblical doctrines and alterations of biblical books. This is the very reason why critics of the Trinity, Christ's deity, and the virgin birth have full license or warrant to deny these apparent biblical doctrines. So going forward, we'll review certain popular Israelite objections to Christian doctrine. And my goal is not to argue that Israelites shouldn't make objections to scripture or any Christian doctrines. I repeat, my goal is not to argue that Israelites shouldn't make objections to scripture or any Christian doctrines. But my goal is to point out inconsistencies in our reasoning. Namely, the double standard that Israelites have in scrutinizing the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and, and the virgin birth, while at the same time railing against Israelites who critique and scrutinize, scrutinize the letters of Paul. The double standard is that Israelites will deny a doctrine that is explicitly supported by scripture, i.e. the virgin birth or the deity of Christ but then appeal to what's written in scripture to defend the writings of Paul. The intellectually honest Israelite should be able to acknowledge Paul's writings as potentially erisome or fallible, just the same as the virgin birth or Christ's deity. Instead, what often occurs when Paul's epistles are challenged are the virtual cries of anathema or heresy from the very same Israelites who deny what is explicitly written about the virgin birth or the deity of Christ. So if you can recognize a plainly written scripture as potentially airsome, then there shouldn't be such a revolt when another potentially airsome scripture is presented to you. Let's talk about these Israelite objections. Okay, we'll focus in on the, uh, the three essential Christian doctrines that Israelites uh, commonly object. Uh, and that will be the Trinity, Christ's deity, and then the virgin birth. So the Trinity doctrine states that there is one eternal God present in three separate and distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Proponents point to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, John 8, verse 58, and Matthew 28, 19 to support the doctrine of the Trinity. So John 1, verses 1 through 4 say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning, and all things were made by Him. Without And without him was not anything made that was made. So basically, this implies Christ as God and Christ as creator. Okay, this is what Christians use. They also use John 8, chapter 58, where Christ says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. So Christ is placing himself before the time of Abraham as a pre-existent being before before Abraham's existence, which suggests that he is God. Well, could suggest this is what Christians this is what Christians used to make their case which seems to adequately support their point if Christ is pre-existent to Abraham then then the question then the question becomes who is Christ and since John 1 1 through 4 says what it says then the Kate then the point is made that Christ is God. Because John 1, 1 through 4 says the word was God and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made, which suggests that he made all things. 
Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Um, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and, the, and of the Holy Ghost. And this basically um, provides uh, scriptural support for the th three persons in the Godhead. Critics to critics to the Trinity doctrine and the deity of Christ doctrine. All right, critics these are Israelites. Uh, appeal to John seven verse sixteen, Mark chapter thirteen verse thirty two, and Luke chapter twenty two forty two. John seven sixteen says. If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. This clearly presents a dilemma because Christ makes the distinction between himself and God. He doesn't say of the Father, he says of God. So the idea is that if Christ were God, why would he use, why would he make the distinction between himself and God? Why wouldn't he just say the Father? Because to make the distinction between himself and God and not himself and the Father, it suggests that he isn't God. Mark chapter 13 verse 32 says, But of that day and that hour, Knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So, <clears throat> this verse presents a, a, a dilemma for the Trinitarian doctrine because if the Son is God, then the Son is omnipotent. I'm sorry, omniscient. And the Son should know. The Son should know everything that the Father knows because they would be both God according to the Trinitarian doctrine, but Christ is admitting by his own admission, he says, not even the son knows. So he is just, he by this verse would be just as ignorant to the day of his return as the angels. And only the father knows. So, so that presents a, a problem for, for Trinitarians because they have to answer why the son who is also God does not know when he's returning especially if he's to be God the omniscient that clearly presents a problem a third verse a third verse Israelites might use as as a critique against the Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, Luke twenty two forty two. This is Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and uh, he prays. He says, "Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done." And this seems to be problematic because. If Christ is God, why would he have a different why would he have a different will? Why would he even need to pray that? Not my will, but thine be done. Why would God the Son have to pray, not my will, but thy will be done? Because they'd both be God. So this presents a little bit of a a, a problem. <clears throat> These are objections of the Trinity. Now, objections of the virgin birth. We'll start with proponents. The virgin birth, the virgin birth doctrine states that Christ was not conceived by physical union between Mary and Joseph, but that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Proponents argue that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit and not the seed of Joseph. So, Obviously, these are pretty, <clears throat> pretty, 
cut and dry um, examples to point to in Scripture. Matthew 1, 18 through 25 and Luke 1 through 26. I'm sorry, Luke 1, 26 through 38. And these passages support the doctrines, the doctrine of the virgin birth. In both accounts, we have uh, both writers communicating that Joseph uh, had not um, been in physical union with Mary as of yet. We have Matthew telling that Joseph um, was feeling confused and having thoughts of putting him putting Mary away uh, in a inconspicuous manner um, uh, in Matthew chapter one we have the angel of the of the Lord the angel of Yahweh speaking to Joseph saying well, telling him that Mary was going to have a child um, and the angel knowing that Joseph wanted to put her away uh, says to him uh, fear not to take Mary fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost so Matthew 1 so in Matthew 1, angel, the angel of Yahweh was telling Joseph to not put Mary away, to not fear taking her as his wife, and that the child that she is pregnant with has been placed there by the um, power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 1, we have the angel of Yahweh speaking to Mary. So Mary's talking to the angel and the angel tells her that she's going to have a child. But she says, I've, n I've never been with a man. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She says in verse 34. The angel answers to her. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So clearly we have very cut and dry passages telling us that you know by the by the words of the angel of Yahweh that Mary's going to have a virgin birth it's pretty cut and dry critics appeal to logic so Israelites will appeal to logic to challenge this essential Christian doctrine and argue that Christ had to be he had to be the son of Joseph in order to be the seed of David. But at the same time, they have to deny what is written, what is explicitly written in Matthew 1, 18 to 25 and Luke 1, 26 to 38. They have to deny these scriptures. So if we're judging by solely by what is written in the biblical canon and we presume the biblical canon to be infallible, perfect. No flaw, no error. Then proponents for each of these doctrines, the Trinity, Christ's deity, and the virgin birth, have an undeniable case. Let me repeat that. If we are judging solely by what is written in the biblical canon, and we presume that the biblical canon is infallible, then proponents for these three essential Christian doctrines, the Trinity, Christ, deity, and the virgin birth, have an undeniable case. But if we are to challenge the biblical canon, right? The biblical canon, the work of the ecumenical councils, those who put together the biblical, count, biblical canon, and the presumption that the biblical canon is infallible if we if we challenge this presumption that the biblical canon is infallible if we argue that it is actually fallible and ha and is subject to error and liable to have error in it then critics of the trinity Christ and Christ's deity and the virgin birth also make an undeniable case 
So the most important question, most important choice for Israelites to make is A, deciding to acknowledge and accept scriptural fallibility, flaw, error in the canon, or B, to affirm scriptural infallibility. I'll repeat that. The most important choice for Israelites to make at this point is A, deciding to acknowledge and accept scriptural fallibility, the idea that there is flaw or error in the, in the biblical canon, or B, to affirm scriptural infallibility. So with A, you risk... Um, you risk receiving a backlash. It's really sort of this guttural reflex of um, astonishment when one is to deny the presumption that Scripture is infallible. When you say Scripture is fallible, you're liable to receive a wave of criticism by Christians and Israelites alike. But it should but it should be noted that if you affirm the latter, right? If you affirm B that the scripture is infallible, then you would undermine your own challenge to the Trinity, Christ's deity and the virgin birth. Right? If you if you affirm that scripture is infallible, then you undermine the Israelite undermines his or her own challenges to the Trinity, Christ's deity, and the virgin birth. Because if the scriptures are indeed infallible, then one should not challenge the scriptural passages that support the previously stated Christian doctrines. If scripture is is indeed infallible, then an Israelite doesn't have any business challenging any scriptural passages that support the previously stated Christian doctrines, the Trinity, Christ deity, and the virgin birth. Critics of Paul challenge the biblical canon just as critics of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the virgin birth. Except the critics of Paul are critiquing Paul's works. We're challenging Paul's works. And in order to do that, we also challenge the 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 presumption of the principle of infallibility in the Bible. So the common goal that critics of Paul and critics of the of the three essential Christian doctrines, Trinity, deity of Christ, and virgin birth, the common bo- the common goal that they both have is that both challenge what is plainly written in Scripture to successfully make their arguments. In order to make their case, both of them have to look at Scripture, see what Scripture says, and they have to say, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't add up. I don't believe what the Bible says right there. The critic, the, the critics of the deity of Christ can't make his or, his or her own case without denying John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and the critic of the ver- and the critics of the virgin birth can't make their case without deeming airsome Matthew 1 through 18 through 25 and Luke 1 26 through 38 likewise the critic of Paul can't make his or her case without deeming airsome Scriptures like Ephesians 2.15 and Galatians 2.3. Let's go into it really quick. Ephesians 2 says, 
I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.15 says, well, let's start with 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace so he's talking about christ abolishing the law okay i can read that back from from verse 11 wherefore remember that ye being in time past gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands it at, that at the time ye were without Christ, he's talking to Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath broken both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So he calls the law of commandments, the law of Elohim, he calls it enmity. In Galatians 2, he calls it bondage. <clears throat> Let's read Galatians 2, 3. But neither, so, so we'll begin at verse 1. And he's going to talk about how the... The Jews in that quarter subjected Titus to be, I'm sorry, compelled Titus to be circumcised. Verse 1, the 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in private, privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, they might bring us into bondage. Talking about the law of circumcision. The truth is... The original commandment given to um, even far back as Abraham, but was given at Sinai to Moses is that it should be one law for the Israelite and one law for the stranger, the strangers who were to sojourn, the strangers who were to celebrate the feasts were to also be circumcised. So. This verse right here, Galatians 2, 3, it's not true. Titus, if he was converted, he should have indeed been circumcised. He was indeed compelled by the law of Elohim to be circumcised. Okay. <clears throat> so, the Israelite must decide whether both are wrong in challenging the infallibility of scripture or whether both are justified in challenging the infallibility of scripture, right? The Israelite must decide whether he and the he or she and also the critics of Paul are wrong in challenging the infallibility of scripture to make their case or whether they're justified. One cannot without a hypocritical double standard accuse one and justify the other i'll repeat that one cannot without a hypocritical double standard accuse one and justify the other why because both are daring to deem scripture as fallible or airsome in order to make their respective case right the critics of the the critics of the three essential Christian doctrines must look at scripture right when they're looking at when they're um, 
denying the deity of Christ, they have to look at John 1 verses 1 through 4 and say, that's not right. I don't agree with that. That's fallible. The critics of the the virgin birth must look at two considerably large portions of scripture. Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and also Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. And they must look at those passages of scripture, those two passages, of those two chunks of scripture, and say, that's not right. That is fallible. That's air that's airsome that's flawed they must look at scripture at what is written clearly on the page and 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 deem it fallible and the same for the critic of paul so the critics of paul look at if we'll look at ephesians chapter 215 and galatians 2 3 and say that's not right that's fallible. That's airsome. So, so no matter if you're a critic of the three essential Christian doctrines, or if you're a critic of Paul, you're looking at what's plainly written in Scripture and deciding that you don't agree with what is written on those pages. Now, some will gasp at that. <gasps> You're denying what's clearly written in the Bible, the infallible holy writ. But if you consider that the scriptures aren't infallible, that they are fallible, and that they are subject to error because crooked and bloody ambitious men took the documents and altered them, according to their wickedness and their hatred against the law of Elohim and, and, and the scriptures that were of, of their captive nation, the Israelites, then it might be a little bit easier to look at the Bible and be able to scrutinize it and criticize it and see it as fallible. See it as the product of, of bloody, ambitious men. But, but make no mistake that when you're challenging what is written on those pages, you are challenging the presumption, no matter if you're denying the virgin birth or the Trinity or the deity of Christ, you are just like the critic of Paul denying what's clearly, clearly written on the pages of the Bible that most of Christianity and probably even well plenty Israelites will will say is infallible scripture and they'll rail against you for challenging what is written on the page but me I, I I'm I'm with I'm with the critic. I welcome the scrutiny. I say I say Israelites should look at that Bible. Should look at that biblical canon written by Romans and they should challenge what's on the scripture. Because if for in order for a person to deem infallible biblical scripture, they would have to they would essentially have to count as, as pure the agency of these Roman hands. As if these Roman hands didn't have reason to change anything. Now, clearly we know that they did. And we, we, we clearly know that they, they indeed did. Marcion did. But how many Christians know that? How many in the Israelite community know that? How many people simply think that the Israelite scriptures passed into Roman hands unaltered and unchanged 
unmolested, unperverted onto, onto the pages of the Holy Bible. And every person has to decide for themselves how sensible that sounds to them. I know how sensible it sounds to me, and it doesn't sound very sensible at all. It would take a very simple-minded person to, to think that a nation as wicked as Rome, and a, clearly an enemy of Israel, wouldn't do anything to confound the nation, and that by the, by the curses of Deuteronomy 28, Elohim wouldn't allow confusion onto the pages of the scripture. When we're dealing with this principle of what is holy writ, what is, it, what is authoritative scripture, we are talking in terms of Roman authority. Because Rome was the one who deemed certain scriptures, certain interpretations as authoritative by their ecumenical councils. And to straight away decide that no one should question what's on those pages. We're sort of ignoring the possibility of um, Roman wickedness occurring in the scriptures. But, but history clearly tells us that it did happen. That Romans did pervert the scriptures. Right? And clearly... Critics of the Trinity, critics of the deity of Christ, critics of virgin birth are sensing some agency of Roman perversion in the scriptures. In order to challenge those doctrines, an Israelite has to be wary or suspicious that, that there are unbiblical doctrines, unsound doctrines written onto the pages of the Bible. But the question I'm asking is why do they hold that standard when it comes to the virgin birth, the deity of Christ and the Trinity, but not when it comes to Pauline epistles? When clearly the history history says that Marcion altered the Pauline epistles. We don't know what an unaltered Pauline epistle looks like. All we know is what Marcion was able to get his hands on that's what we see in the scriptures now what he what he changed what he didn't change that's unknown to us until we get an unaltered pauline epistle we won't know but but israelites will the same critics of the trinity the virgin birth and the deity of christ will rail against the critics of paul and appeal to what's written in the scriptures to support what they believe about Paul. But they challenge the the infallibility of scripture just just as the the critic of Paul does. So there's an inconsistency and a double standard. So hopefully now pro Paul Israelites can see the dilemma. Something like this can trigger emotions or Denial and emotions of denial and frustration, but if we're being a hundred percent honest, it's something to deeply consider. It's a bit confusing for Israelites to rail against Christians for leaning on Paul's doctrine and to issue vain challenges for them to prove their doctrine without without Paul, especially when pro Paul Israelites themselves aren't willing to dispense with Paul. Truth is, Paul works for Christians, so there's no reason for Christians to dispense with or feel any shame for not doing so. But there's many reasons for an Israelite to dispense with Paul. There seems to be an emotional connection that just won't allow Israelites to, to dispense with Paul. I'm not sure many can explain why they need him. And the great irony is that they hold on to Paul and challenge Christians to let him go. 
But when you challenge pro-Paul Israelites to let Paul go, when you challenge pro-Paul Israelites to let him go or to even give hearing to critiques of his writings, then you risk suffering, rage, and curses. Kind of funny to hear that out loud, right? But does the emotional sensitivity not reveal that a pro-Paul Israelite might realize the truth? but just might not be ready to face it. I issue the challenge for Israelites to give hearings to critiques of Paul's epistles. After all, if they don't stand up to scrutiny, won't it be apparent? At the very least, pro-Paul Israelites should be able to acknowledge the double standard they espouse. If you can challenge the principle of scriptural infallibility concerning the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the virgin birth, and so can the critics of Paul. So I hope this discussion was edifying. Um, feel free to like, share, and leave a comment. Um, you can also post your questions in the Biblical Rumble Room and tag me. Uh, also feel free to post your own uh, video responses and tag me in it. And uh, we can take the conversation from there. All right. Thanks for tuning in, family. Until next time, peace, light, and shalom. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it.